we've been able to join. Sorry, we record the meetings now. So before you start, I have to record it. Okay. Okay. Any other little housekeeping things like that that we? Um, no, I mean, if you're not speaking, then you probably want to mute yourselves. Um, mm -hmm. There's always a lot of background noise that come in. Mm -hmm. And then just, I'll be recording. Okay. And so is Christopher Doman not able to be here? I haven't heard it from Chris Christopher said he was going to be here. So hopefully he's checking in momentarily. Okay. I'll see um, if I can contact him. I'll text him as well. Well, while that's going forward, the second item on the agenda is to approve the minutes from last year, September 30th, 2021. It's been almost an entire year. And I'll just remind you in case that isn't fresh at the top of your mind, that what we did at that last meeting was to approve the original design for the guest house at the Wilders. Oh, there's Christopher, welcome. Um, and that, that there's going to be a change that we're discussing tonight. That is the reason for this meeting. Hi, Drew, welcome, and Christopher. Do you want, do you want more details on those minutes before we move forward with approving them? Then when you do go through, um, I'll, sort of those I'll make a motion to approve. I think there was a question. Oh, I was just going to say when you, after you get the motion in the second to approve, you want to do a roll call per the clerk. Okay. Uh, Ilya has moved to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I'll second. Holly. Okay. Christopher and Holly both, but uh, we'll go ahead then. Um, I'll speak only to those of you who were here for that meeting. So, Siri? Yes, here. And approving the meeting? Yes. Okay. Holly? Yes. I'm just looking at you as you appear on my screen. <laughs> uh, Ilya? I approve. Okay. And I believe that those were the people, and Chris and Drew Chris was there. Drew? Approve. Yeah. Okay, and Christopher. Approves. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then we'll move on to the next item to review the new proposal for the Wilders guest house. And uh, I'm gonna turn this over then to Bob, the architect. Sorry, Susan, may I interrupt? Please. So that was, one, two, three, four, five, six of you that approved and three of you that are abstaining. The new members can't approve because they weren't present. That's why they're abstaining. Correct. That's fine. I'm just, I'm just clarifying to making sure I got my numbers right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Christopher. Before we begin, could, could we have some counsel from Jody and maybe Ilya and Susan concerning a non-contributing property with an addition and how we should look at it based on um, precedent and current rules? Good question. Jody, can you fill us in on that? Well, for any kind of addition, obviously it's a gonna be a non-contributing addition. Um, you wanna look to make sure that it's compatible um, with the neighborhood and the surrounding homes. You still want it to fit in to to what's around there um, obviously you don't want something that's all like a quonset hut <laughs> it's the quonset hut edition because that's not going to fit in and be compatible with the neighborhood um, i would say it still has to adhere to the guidelines and the materials that are laid out in the el presidio guidelines um, but you just are want, wanting to look at compatibility. Does that address your question or did you want more? It, it does, thank you. A any additions from Ilya and Susan? I think, you know, when we're looking at new construction, um, there might be different issues that we would consider um, or, or uh, uh, qualities if it was 
on the street. Uh, this particular project actually is behind a historic structure, or not a historic structure, another uh, infield uh, structure. And uh, I think according to Bob that it's not even visible from the street. But if we were looking at uh, new construction on the street, we would be looking at all the classic things as far as setback and rhythm and pattern and uh, heights, uh, roof style, all of the things that we normally would consider. Christopher, that would be my response as well, that we can't see this, this structure from the street. And th that matters in terms of design questions and all the other issues that we know contribute to these reviews. That, that really helps. I just wanted to get that out, out, out there before Bob begins his presentation. Thank you. Good, good. Okay, Bob, take it away. Okay, is a uh, screen sharing enabled? Yeah, it should be a problem. Okay, let's see, there we go. All right, hmm. there is, yeah, you can see it here, but it's hiding behind this. Let's see if I can... All right, I'm trying to get this to fill the screen. Has a, has a PowerPoint popped up yet? As you can see, we can see the we can see the pictures of the Wilder residence and okay. the historic district map. Okay, uh, I'm trying to get it to fill my screen, and it's not wanting to do that. But maybe it looks different to you. No, it's it's no. it's reduced. Hi everyone, Bob. You need to do new share, and oh. then choose the PowerPoint. Okay, so new share, and let's see. Now I want to go to the desktop, which is not that um, share, and I want the actual. Let's see. Let's try this. <clears throat> All right, now I can't see what's going on here. Means we're behind here. Oh gosh. This is the trouble with having Bahar at home instead of in the office. <laughs> All right. yeah. Yeah. It's not... There, I got it. Amazing. I had to dash in there. Okay, slide one. Are we seeing it? Nope. Oh. See it, yeah. Stop share. Um, share screen. Um, is that working at all? Yes, Robert, Beth has started screen There sharing. we go. There you are. Okay, there we go. It's like a you know tight wire act. Okay, so this is of course the uh, Wilder home on Main Avenue, as it is seen from the street. Um, mud adobe uh, exposed walls and some shed roof forms. Our contacts within the historic district on Main Avenue. Um, this non-contributor is Joe and Peggy's house, which has this little zigzag plan to it. And an aerial. And um, it, originally the house began as a big L, and actually it was designed by Corky. And then I added, I added the zig to the zag <laughs> uh, for Joe and Peggy a few years ago. I should also be noted that uh, Drew Cook was also a student of mine some years ago, what, um, eight or 10 years ago, Drew, I think. And uh, he also works with my son, Arthur, at the Century Room in Hotel Congress. So there's all kinds of Tucson connections here. Um, so since we were in front of you a, uh, nearly a year ago, so just, just over 10 months ago, we came forward with a little standalone uh, casita in the back of the home here. And our thinking has evolved uh, actually um, in response to the comments and concerns we heard um, back last fall. Um, here is the uh, Wilder residence, 350 North Main, non-contributing properties, uh, including Jonna's house here, which actually we were relating to last year in our design. And we've now thought about how to relate more to the original Wilder residence and address Jonna's concern of the porch um, invading her privacy. And that's actually the main driver of this redesign um, is that uh, Joe and Peggy wanting to be good neighbors 
didn't want to feel that they were impinging upon their um, longtime and uh, neighbor and dear friend, Jana to the north. So these are just running through the context photos. This is in our application packet, the street elevation sort of strung together, um, showing the nature of the architecture, tall adobe buildings, pitched roofs. Um, it's really a, an eclectic neighborhood because you have some uh, Victorian and Queen Anne style as well as uh, some territorial uh, and actually original adobes in the mix. Here is actually a photo off the city of Tucson GIS with actually, this is the true uh, north is straight up. Main Avenue actually is skewed like this. Um, and here is Joe and Peggy's house. Um, they have a little uh, storage shed here, which appropriately enough has a shed roof. And then this is another precedent that we're relating to an historic contributing property here to the south, establishing the zero lot line um, precedent as we, and we also see that here on Meyer Avenue, although I have to say the, the buildings on the east side of this center property line are in fact actually not in our development zone uh, because they open onto Meyer Avenue, not onto Maine. But you can see that there is um, a precedent uh, for, uh, for zero lot line in the neighborhood. And again, we're still thinking of building here and back. Another driver besides um, respecting John's privacy is preserving this mesquite tree, which is a large and mature and actually quite healthy tree that Joe and Peggy would like to preserve. So here again, this is the Wilder front porch on Main Avenue. Here is the north wall of the current home. And this is a shed roof that slopes from north to south. So the high end of the slope is on the north side. The wall is 16 feet high. And uh, views to the north, uh, John is home which has a hipped roof, metal, uh, corrugated metal. Here's the Ocotillo fence along the property line. Um, another comment that Jana had last year, she again was quite concerned with her privacy and she, she asked me at the meeting whether um, I thought Joe and Peggy would agree to put up a metal fence along the wall instead of the Ocotillo. And I said, well, I suppose they would be in order to honor your privacy. Um, however, when I spoke with Joe and Peggy, they weren't too keen on the idea of a metal fence. They prefer the Ocotillo. Um, metal, of course, is, is a heat collector and a heat radiator, and they'd rather have greenery. Um, that's another factor in saying, well, let's address John's privacy concerns in another way rather than with a metal fence um, in a redesign of the building. Um, so but once again, uh, the street presence of Wilder is you know, rectangular as solids. Um, pitching roofs. Here's the east end of their house showing that 16 foot high wall on the north sloping down to 10 on the south. And we are proposing now in our current redesign to relate uh, to that um, more than to the surrounding hip roof houses. Um, here is a view of the east side of the property. This large wall um, actually is a privacy wall built by another client of mine a few years ago, Eva Harris. And she actually put this wall up, which is I think a 12 foot high masonry wall and then a four foot high um, rusted metal screen to preserve Joe and Peggy's privacy in their courtyard because we had turned her attic into actually um, a dance studio of all things. And we had opened a dormer to the West and she could see right into Joe and Peggy's backyard and they could see right into her dance studio. And she was really generous and um, kind enough to say, well, to honor your privacy, we will um, erect this tall wall. It also gave her a terrific uh, sheltered, shaded courtyard on her side of the of that privacy wall. Now, this is the property uh, due east of Joan Peggy. As you can see, it's sort of a hodgepodge. There's a little adobe room here that turns the corner. There's some cyclone fencing. There's some chain link. There's some corrugated metal that's just wired onto the chain link. It's, again, it's kind of a hodgepodge. And here's this tree. Uh, Joan Peggy had it trimmed up, and it's really uh, a thriving tree. Uh, looking along that east property line wall. Um, and then again, this is built zero lot line. Here's the property to the south built zero lot line. And that's also a shed roof shedding onto the neighbor's property. Here's the uh, Joan Peggy's little storage shed. Again, as I mentioned, having a shed roof. That's why we call it a shed roof, right? <laughs> so anyway, there's an ample precedent for the form that we were proposing. Here's a view due south, Eva Harris's privacy wall, zero lot line shed building. And actually this doorway, which is an historic doorway, is on the property line. Of course, with today's building code, that would not be uh, permitted. You can't have openings right on the property line. It would need to be 
solid, but it's existing and there it is. Um, looking back to the Southwest, there's the little shed roof storage building. So that's our context. Now a year, not quite a year ago, let's not exaggerate, 10 months ago, we presented to you this little, uh, uh, little, <laughs> um, how would I describe, hip roof, casita with a little hat on it, you know, just like this perfect little symmetrical uh, object. And now we're back with less of an object and more of a space uh, definer. Um, so our current proposal is a simplified, um, well, actually, it's a shifted rectangle, so it, it has a bit of a zigzag to it. It zigs and zags around the tree. This is a shed roof sloping towards you. This is an open porch on the corner, and we'll go into the plan view here. Here is a site um, combined floor plan, site slash floor plan, Joe and Peggy's house. Actually, this is the part that uh, uh, Corky uh, designed with Bob Lanning as his assistant at that time. And then this is the part that I added and this garden wall and the porch, the covered porch here. So this is actually a joint uh, poster vent uh, project um, over many years. I actually used to work with Cork at the Design Center and actually that was 40 years ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a small town, right? Um, so our new plan is to put the porch on the Southwest corner so that the volume of this building that slips past provides privacy to John's house here to the north. And we propose to keep the Ocotillo fence here. And as you see, the, the plan shifts, slides back around the tree. And we're proposing to take it to the lot line because there's frankly not much happening behind the house that you would actually want to experience. And the little adobe wall would join up with uh, Eva Harris's wall here. There's Joe and Peggy's storage shed. And we've left enough of a yard here, I think it's 24 feet, to preserve these two trees as well. And as you can see, the volumes or the forms of this house um, extend and relate to primarily the uh, current residents, the wilder residents um, on North Main. Here again, you have the neighboring property that is zero lot line, which is our whoops, which is our precedent. Oh, that's a sensitive thing, isn't it? Touch screen. Okay, um, let's go from the site floor plan to a site roof plan. Um, again, we're also, we are, we are proposing a solar array on the roof of the main home. This is a shed roof sloping north to south, and here's a shed roof sloping west to east. We also propose to slope east to west, so our high corner is on this end, and our low corner is on this end, and that achieves several things. One is, it allows us to have an overhang that shades the windows on the south, to keep out the summer sun and let in the winter sun, and it also creates a sheltered courtyard on the corner. And so you can see um, there's an L shape here with a shed roof form. These sheds slope um, high to low. This is kind of the opposite. It's an L in reverse and the low end is here and the high end is here. Zooming on the floor plan, um, there's the existing home. Here's the 24 feet I mentioned between this existing adobe garden wall and the front of our proposed new house. Houselet, houselet, casita. You can see this is the kitchen. A little dine-in kitchen, um, a bathroom on this corner, plumbing in this area of the house, door out to the east where this mesquite tree is thriving. We propose uh, to build a wall along the property line, and so that would sort of that would clean up this kind of hodgepodge of varying materials along that east wall. Um, and again, you can see it's sort of all one room, uh, dining, living, sleeping, an efficiency type arrangement with a covered porch on the corner um, in large floor plan. I will say this, uh, having traveled uh, a fair amount in uh, Mexico, in particular in Sonora, that this house type um, with a corner porch sort of carved out of the volume of the house is something you see in all the little rural towns in Sonora because you want a covered outdoor space and it's great if it opens off of your living space. And uh, they tend to do this. It's something you'd see, like if you went down uh, a little side street in San Ignacio, Sonora, you would see this house plan happening there. Um, and again, it, um, in that whole tradition of Presidio neighborhood, which goes back to the Spanish period. So we are proposing south facing windows for a passive solar gain. Um, we are proposing smaller windows facing west because of that harsh orientation. Uh, we are also proposing to reuse this little grill that Joe brought back from Mexico, actually, that we had in the other plan, and there's our entry door. So in terms of relating uh, to the existing, 
These are elevation, site elevations showing the current home and the proposed casita. Um, this is a north elevation. Um, there are, we're proposing two tiny windows um, on the north side of the um, bathroom, one in the shower, one above the toilet. These would be high windows. The sills are at eight feet and they would have a brick screen um, to create privacy. Oh, I, gosh, there's a photo I, I should have included of a similar screen we did for Joe and Peggy on their audition back oh, 20 years ago. Um, so again, it would bring in some light, but the vis you know, visually it's screened. So there's um, no, uh, and also those windows would, would be fixed glass with a brick screen. So those are those little windows. And on the original home, there are some high windows that are also similarly proportioned high in the wall. And um, so let's see, so that's the north, that's existing home. Here's the south elevation of the existing home. And you can see there's some, this was something I was into and in those, Years of years gone by was uh, letting different windows have different heights. Some of these were recycled windows. This was actually one from Joe's mother's house that we used. It had some hand painting on it. And this part of the old house actually had a higher floor than the rest and it stepped down. So we let that window float up. And it's actually something I learned from Jim Gresham. He, he always objected when, when all the windows were at the same height. He said, it looks like they were strung on a clothesline and he liked to let his windows wander up and down to add visual interest. And I have to agree with him. So um, so this is the south elevation. You see the roof is sloping high to low, west to east. We're sloping east to west. And here we have that overhanging eave to shelter those, those windows. Enlarged elevations of the Rose Casita. On the west, the uh, door and grill are set back 10 feet on the corner porch. That's the kitchen window. On the north, this is actually the north wall of the living, dining, sleeping room. And we have no windows there at all, which again would be beneficial, I think, to, um, for the neighbor's privacy. Here's those tiny windows with brick, um, perforated brick patterns to screen them. And of course they don't line up with the service room door. That's actually a door to the um, water heater room. And we have, we're proposing two water heaters, one for domestic water and the other um, for radiant floor heat. That's something Joe and Peggy really like. I did that for them in their addition in the front of the main house. And it's been really, um, it's been really good for them. <laughs> they love getting out of bed and putting their, their cold feet on the warm floor. It's a great way to greet the morning and winter. So this is the east elevation, which actually you wouldn't really see because it would be zero lot line and we'd have a wall, but that's the door into the little passageway to the kitchen, another small high window in the bathroom. South elevation, uh, two good sized windows, very similar to the windows on the existing home, uh, casement windows, wood casement windows. And then that's the little covered porch. So zooming back out to the big picture, there's our site, um, there's our relationship to the existing home, and there's our zero lot line uh, precedent. Materials wise, we are still proposing to use this insulating concrete form uh, made of recycled uh, post-consumer recycled styrofoam. Um, we built a couple of buildings out of this material in the last year, and it's really, I think it's a good material. Gives you a really high insulation and a very solid wall. Um, and it actually, you pound on it, it's solid, it feels like masonry. And uh, color-wise, um, we are thinking of matching the south wall of the current Wilder residence. It has the living room area um, was stuccoed. Um, again, originally the house was all exposed adobe. It's the um, old Pueblo asphalt stabilized adobe, which in time, with, you know, weathers and the fines rinse out. And they were having you know monsoon rain blowing through their um, through their south wall, so they had it plastered with integral color lime plaster. And this kind of rose tint is what we're thinking of for the for the casita, and that is where we are. And at this point, I will pause and take your questions and comments. Questions or comments? Looks beautiful. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Quick question. Thank you for the presentation. Yes. I, I, I disagree that you, you can't see it from the street. I, I think you can. And I think that um, quite often we're reminded to not consider foliage as part of the, the existing condition. But I, I, don't, I actually don't think that's a problem. Had you mentioned the, um, the addition of air conditioning at all? Ah, let's see. Um, oh, for the main house? Is there, is there equipment, any, any equipment that should oh, would be included? Oh, I'm sorry. In yeah. that? 
in the addition. I am, let me go, I'm going to zoom back to the site plan. We are proposing to locate a compressor in this corner, and it would be a split system heat pump. So both cooling and heating would be provided um, by this unit that's tucked into this corner um, against solid walls. And as, again, uh, kind of off on the far side from any neighbors. And then we would have the fan coil, the heat exchanger above this module um, blowing into the to the uh, living room so we can have a higher ceiling in the living room. But our thinking is, uh, yeah, that, that's, that would be our, our approach to air conditioning. All of the equipment is tucked into that um, south corner, the south Correct. corner. Correct. So we wouldn't see anything at all from the street or from the adjacent property to the north. Exactly. That's exactly right. And it would, it would be housed in a little corrugated uh, metal fence, but it's tucked here against Eva Harris's wall and against this zero lot line house here. That's a great place. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. Thank you, Bob. Uh, this is Siri. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question regarding lighting. Uh, would you talk about the specifically the exterior lighting strategy, if you have one yet? Ah, I think we'll have lighting under the porch, and that would basically be it. Um, so yeah, I don't believe we're considering any other outdoor lighting, um, but certainly any lighting we do propose will be dark skies compliant. Uh, I have to admit, we haven't gotten into that level of design yet, but I think uh, conceptually this would be lighted um, from below the, below the uh, porch, so it would be you know, full cut off. I have a question about the windows mm. on the um, west side. Yes. Are they flush with the uh, building wall? Are they set in? Um, so yeah, one nice thing about this um, perfect block is that it is, 12 inches thick. So we can set mm -hmm. windows back to the inside and have a window sill. Um, and that uh, Joe and Peggy really like that feel of a thick walled right. building. Right. And so, yeah, the windows would be set to the inside of the wall, not the outside. The only thing that strikes me is that the, um, the window over the kitchen in proportion to the window um, at the entrance to the house uh, under the porch that the proportions to me seem a little odd, um, mm. but that just may be my take. Yeah, so the size of this window into the living area, living dining area is driven by the size of the grill that we're <laughs> installing. And that's, I think it's just a, uh, an aesthetic thing. Joe and Peggy wanna integrate this uh, traditional wrought iron Mexican grill with the house to give it you know, a sense of place and a, a sure. feeling of, of, of age and time. And I, I didn't include this. There's a couple of photos I should have included from the edition we did in front of their home where we did both a Mexican iron grill and we did a brick patterned. Right, split. right, I'm familiar and, with that. Yeah, I, I, if I had thought of it ahead of time, I would have dropped some photos in of those elements because we're, we're extending that. Um, we're extending that tradition really on, on site. Well, and uh, the, the uh, grill with the uh, window uh, under the porch lets a lot of light in. Uh, to me, what seems a little out of balance is the window over uh, uh, in the kitchen. And one of the pleasant things to do when personally, uh, when you're cooking is, is to have, if you have that luxury to have a window looking out and it, it does seem smaller than a standard window size. Am I wrong? Let's see, let me zoom in on that. Um, so we have the seal at three foot four and we have the head at six foot eight. So it's a 40 inch tall window. Um, I think the idea was, you know, knowing that the west sun is really hard to, uh, to control um, was to uh, keep that window uh, small. Uh, there's a second window looking out to the covered porch here that mm -hmm. one can see through. This one's above the kitchen sink, which is classic, right? You're doing right. it. Nice to look out. Um, but we, we snuck a second window into the corner here 
um, at the expense of upper cabinets, again, to bring some light in and have greater visibility onto this covered porch. Which is nice, yeah. So. Actually, that's the- Other thoughts or questions? Yes. Um, hi, Bob, this is Holly Freitas. So um, I really liked your first design, but I have to say I like this one better. Oh. Um, Okay. So thank thank you for reconceptualizing it. the The first design was was beautiful, but this one, what I like about it is it has continuity with the front house, and so it has more time and place with mm -hmm. the front house and the lot. And um, so, I and and I really like the way that it's designed with those privacy considerations. Um, so I, 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 I like this one better. So thank you for bringing it forward. Oh yeah, you're welcome. And actually uh, there's someone else who would have liked this design better. And that was my old professor, Judith Chafee, <laughs> would not have liked the first one at all because it was frankly revivalistic. Um, and this one is actually more, you know, in, in keeping with uh, her principles. The one thing though, she probably wouldn't have liked is the West window, even a small one she had this kind of uh, analysis of, well, the West sun is impossible to control. Mm. There are no windows on the West. <laughs> that was her right. but, but the thing about the West window, the large West window, and that's it's under a covered patio. So it, it has some protection. And, um, and quite honestly, having, you know, my house has a little cut out front porch and we treat it almost as an extra room um, we spend a lot of time out there. And so I, I love that addition as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And then actually, you know, Christopher has written the book about Judith. So I don't know. <laughs> Do you agree with my uh, assessment? Just to, take that, just to take the bait, Bob. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was looking at that West window too, and I was thinking about Ilya's comments, with the, which I think were spot on. Mm. That existing mesquite is really helpful for that West window. And mm. so I, I think it's well, it's well placed. And the larger windows are, are under a bit of cover, although I think they might get hit hard, but again, that mosquito is there, which is really nice. I was looking at the, the scale of those, the door and that existing grill and window. It, it reads kind of funny on your drawing because if you look at the plan, Bob, they're actually the same dimension, mm. like they're three foot four. Mm. But when you look at your elevation drawing of that front door and the, the adjacent window near that dining table, mm. um, they look, sort of out of scale together. But I think in your, I, don't, I, don't, I would check your elevation. So I think your floor plan makes complete sense the way you have that sort of relationship between the door and the window set up. The, the grills seem a little incongruous. I mean, it, it seems a bit sort of mannerist in the way you've got the, 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 the very articulated front door kind of security mm -hmm. screen and then the, the other grill. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really liked your analysis just to, follow up on the previous comment of the, the hip roof. But thinking about it more, the scale was a bit high. And so I think this the scale of this building, the way it sort of sheds and sort of steps down, makes a lot of sense. And you, you, you balance a very difficult kind of dance, I guess, when you're trying to talk about precedent and non-contributing structures. It, it's a tough thing to balance out. And I think you, you, actually, you actually did a really nice job. Um, the one thing that I, I would think about is, I believe that we are to consider the, the view from the street without the existing trees because they could go away in time. And so, in fact, I, I've looked at this property several times through that lens, and I think you could see it. Mm. Um, and I, I think it's okay. I, I think it relates in a, a scale way. I still can't believe you got that 15 foot wall through, Bob. Nice job, by the way. <laughs> um, but you, now you're, you're making up for it by sort of integrating this building into it, which I think that's is, right. is really is, is, is nicely done. I think that zero lot line to the east makes a lot of sense. Cool. The, one, the one thing I, I think I would think about more, the, the two things I guess I have concern about, one is, is that the grill, that existing sort of very articulated grill at the front door and the simpler grill adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure about that with existing precedent. I would, if you don't mind, look at that north elevation of the proposed guest house as well. Mm -hmm. where, where is that? Oh, yeah, there it is, number two. Okay. That drawing number two, if you could. Is there a way to scroll over to that? Yeah, are we looking at? Elevation two. I, yeah, that, that's it right there, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think there is precedent for the smaller kind of window and utility you know, areas. So I, I, I see that quite often in, in, a, in a lot of parts of the neighborhood. And that makes complete sense. I think that one door for the utilities with, with the, 
the the ventilation on top and bottom. Mm. I think that mm. may be something to consider a bit more seriously because that's one of the areas that the adjacent neighbor will see directly. Mm. And possibly that is one little small view that you'll get from the street is that corner. Mm. So possibly trying to integrate that door a little more sensitively into the precedent of the neighborhood could be really helpful because that's, even though it's kind of the back of the property, the adjacent property has a strong view of it mm. um, looking south. And then possibly, I think the way I've, I've, I've sort of peered into this several different times, that might be the actual view that you get of that corner from the street if, if the trees kind of go away a bit. Um, those, are, those are my last two thoughts. I, I think it's, a, it's, it's hard to believe, Bob. I, I, I like your previous design too, mm -hmm. but I think this one is even more sensitively integrated. Yeah, okay. nice job. Thank you. I think I, you know, I agree that door is your pretty much your plain vanilla, uh, you know, utility door, and it probably could be treated differently. You know, maybe we make it out of out of rusted uh, corrugated metal and or something. So it looks because there is a rusted gate that goes into the home. Let me jump down to the last slide. Um, whoopsie, what did I do? Screen sharing has stopped. Uh oh, I, I unshared. <laughs> Um, let's see if I can get it back again. Oops. As, as you're getting it back, I mean, I guess there's there's sizes that are required by HVAC and different uh, pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily what we have to do for the design of the door. So maybe there's a, a difference between the need for the equipment and the design for the door. Okay, am I back? Should yes. I? Okay, let's see if I can zoom in on this slide. There we go. So, oops, yeah, at the very end of the, current home, there's a diagonal rusted metal gate that um, is actually a full six foot eight high. And I think that would actually eclipse your view. I think you'd see the shed roof going up. You might see the little high windows. I don't know that you'd see that utility room door from the street, but I think Jonna might see it if she looks south. Oh, let's see if this view also, let me see if I can scroll over here. Oops, I went the wrong way. I zoom in here. Okay, there you can see the wrought iron grill that we put on the front of this little addition back a few years ago. Oh, and by the way, also some of you might know Page Rep. Page Rep built this little addition that I designed. And um, after he built it, he says, that's my last Adobe <laughs> build. <laughs> it was also his first Adobe <laughs> build. And he just, you know, he was a good mason and he knew concrete block, but he just found that Adobe was just a little more than he bargained for. And uh, I, I don't think he was especially profitable on this job, but he did honor his bid. I will say that. And he did a good job and we're all pleased with the work he did, but it was, uh, it was his, you know, it was his introduction to Adobe. And I think it was his, it convinced him never to use it again. <laughs> so, oh, and, and then here's some of this pattern brick that I mentioned. This is, these are actually little ventilators into the attic space. <laughs> And just behind this lamppost and this Palo Verde branch, you can see some um, brick screen that we did on the west window into the bedroom. So anyway, I should have uh, thought about that, but I will next time. So, hey Bob, this is Drew. I have some. Hey, I have. Um, I was just going to ask a question about the double hot water heater situation. Are those gas or electric? Um, you know, we haven't decided yet. Um, it's going to depend on the amount of solar we can get off those panels on the roof. Um, so we're thinking about either. Now, the one thing about, actually, the one nice thing about an electric uh, water heater is you can use it as a backup for a solar hot water heater and just use it as a storage tank. We may end up doing that, but um, at this point, I, I, I'm not certain. Okay, because I was gonna say uh, I've had a little experience with the radiant, the radiant heating, uh -huh. and I've seen I've seen someone take a, a gas powered on demand and then put a uh, recirculating pump on there, mm -hmm. and then it could be used as the hot water for the house as well as your heating on the floor. But I know with electric that wouldn't work yeah. very well. I, you know, so I have to we'll have to check that out. On um, when we did the front room addition. Uh, we actually just used a domestic low boy water heater for the floor heat. Um, oh, okay. and, and it, uh, you know, you have a little research pump, you have an expansion tank, and then uh, we ran PEX in the floor. So it's seamless, you know, there's no, and it's non-corrosive. So 
it's been perking away for 20 years without without any problems. And so they, Joe and Peggy want to use it again in, the, in this in this little casita. That's a good good comment, Drew. Because if it is gas, you're going to have some flues coming out of that roof um, right above that door. That's true. Yeah. Good point. Oh, by the way, I like the location of the photovoltaics pan panels. Are really nice, Bob. That's that's a really good place to put them. Okay. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions or other comments that anybody wants to bring up? I'm interested in the parking situation, certainly in years and years to come in the future, because that could be, uh, the casita could be occupied by a whole nother family, actually. Okay, so uh, here's our site plan. And um, currently, uh, there are two spots here in front that Joe and Peggy use, and they can walk right in the front door. They also have the right to two spots on the street right in front of their property. And there's space for three more cars over here. So they actually have got seven parking spaces um, and they'd be required to have three um, under the new ADU ordinance. Um, so we've got more than double the necessary parking and Joan Peggy actually own this lot. Um, and their intention is to preserve this as mm -hmm. landscaping and outdoor gathering. Um, so, I think that's I, so. That's basically where we are with with parking. More than adequate. No. Other comments? Uh, I have one question regarding uh, water once it falls off the roof. What mm. are your thoughts there? Ah, okay. Um, well, I guess right now we were just letting it, you know, flow off and be guided to tree wells and things. We haven't considered a water harvesting system, although those are great. Um, of course, they do add a little cost. They're a good thing. Um, so I don't know whether we'll, whether Joan Peggy would like to do that or not, whether to put in gutters and downspouts and uh, water harvesting. Um, and I suppose if we did that, we'd have to come back in front of this, this board <laughs> and present it as a, as a change. Uh, currently, it's not in the plans. But um, I guess the answer would be, we're, uh, a lot of the water, well, the water from the main hole ends up in this courtyard. And there are some swales and there's some plants there. Um, although I do believe, and I, there's quite a bit of slope from east to west um, that, you know, the, a lot of the water in this whole neighborhood is flowing. Of course, it's trying to get to the Santa Cruz River. And that shows in our elevations here. You can see this is from east to west. There's quite a bit of fall here. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, something we, had discussed, but we didn't follow up on the idea of doing something with, with water harvesting. H has there been much water harvesting done in the neighborhood? I can't recall. No. So there's not an historic precedent for it, but uh, um, I think sorry. primarily other than, than the Christopher uh, Carroll Memorial Park, um, where there's uh, conceptual water harvesting for the uh, desert plantings. Okay. Just one last question, Bob. Hmm. I, I really like the idea of neighborhoods like this, where different sides of the property are used for different times of day. I think that's a typical kind of thing to do uh, in this neighborhood. So you've got a west facing porch and I know there's an east facing little courtyard there. What, what, what is the idea for that courtyard around that large tree? Any thoughts about that right now? Oh, I think, you know, it's just something, um, uh, it, it is a nice space and the tree is real nice and there'll probably be a little sitting area. They may hang a clothesline out there, but it's just something in particular, Peggy wanted to be able to go back and just be in this little north uh, patio. So I'm sure they'll make something of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, it would actually be kind of a nice little space, I think. It's kind of a square in proportion and the tree's doing really well. Actually, it is a nice little space, at least on these drawings. It looks like it would be the place that you'd spend a lot of time. Yeah, yeah especially in the summer, <laughs> it would be cool. Yeah. Are there other comments or questions? Yes, I, 
wanted to comment. I really like the design. It's really unobtrusive. It's not the it's not a design that uh, it's not trying to make a statement that fits in nicely. And uh, I think it's uh, overall really, really good. And uh, I think it would take a real deliberate effort for someone walking along the street to try to see anything back there. You've got the larger structure, the house in the front there that uh, would draw the attention. So I uh, don't see any uh, issues with the. Uh, Anything on there, and the door won't show with the uh, with the gates there. Also thinking too that uh, the lowest and harshest sun in the afternoon and summer starts to pick up some shade from the main house and from the trees. So I don't know how much. Uh, I don't think you get a lot of sun into the kitchen. Yeah, that's you true. After, a lot, the sun starts after about. 430 you'll start getting shade off the main house so it's basically it's between you know 130 and 430 there'll be sun coming in there um, but yeah certainly once the sun sets uh, you know begins to set um, will be shaded by the main house I did have some uh, experience with the floor heating which mm. which I uh, which I do like. And a problem that would come up if you have a uh, on-demand heater, it would mm. tend to short cycle the heater because you know, if it's cold, the, uh, the floor cools down and needs heat. So those types of systems work better if there's some storage where you're not short cycling an on-demand heater mm. you know, as, it, as it's circulating. You're always getting cool water back. So depending on the, on the temperature difference from uh, where it fires up to where it lets it circulate, it could be uh, could be an issue. Yeah, they found that that floor slab warms up and stays warm, and they end up just running it very early in the morning. In fact, Joe put it on a timer, so it starts running at four a.m. switches off at about eight or nine, and then it just stays warm throughout the day. Oh, okay, that's perfect. Yeah. One, one quick question, final question. Uh, sub panel, um, underground overhead electrical lines, what are uh, your? Oh, it certainly would be an underground feed. And um, you know, the current feed is underground um, and we'll back feed the casita from the main house. Um, so it, yeah, we haven't again uh, gotten into the engineering side of it, but uh, definitely all electrical will be underground. And the sub panel? Sub panel, we will probably put on the east side of the kitchen wing, facing away from the neighbors. Um, but those are good questions, and I need to think about those things. So thank you for reminding me. Any further thoughts, final questions? Thank you very much, Bob. You're welcome. Thank a you. Really interesting presentation and an, an interesting project. Well, and it's for interesting people. <laughs> yeah. Do we want to call for a motion for approval? Well, I'm going to move that we approve this and I will second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 I, should, Aye. I should say, Susan, are there are there any nays? That would be easier. Susan, please do a roll call. All right. Could you could you give us the the regular screen back, Bob? Oh so yes, yes, I yes, can yes. be sure to see who. Okay, I will stop sharing. Called upon. There we go. Stop sharing. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, again, I'll just go around. Anita. Approve. Siri. Approve. Alex. Approve. Justin. Approve. Holly. Approve. Ilya. Approve. Christopher. Yay. Approve. 
and I, uh, Drew, oh. Drew. I, th I think he's muted. Approve. Thank you. And I approve. So it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Nice to see y'all. Night. Stay cool. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Bahar. Thank you, Bahar. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Hey. Our our next item is a an update on the Tucson Pima County Historical uh, Commission separations. And I'm giving it. Jody, where are you? Okay, I keep I keep seeing only the castle. Yeah, sorry, I'm like at home, working from home. You like start to put on, you know, t-shirts and sweats. <laughs> so I like put a picture up, so you're not just looking at my name. Um, <laughs> so I want <clears throat> to. You guys don't meet as often, um, and we've kind of given fairly regular updates to the other advisory boards, uh, but I wanted to make sure that you guys are in the loop too. Um, and since we have the meeting, this is a great opportunity to do that. So probably about um, two-ish years ago, two, three years ago, um, Eric Von from the State Historic Preservation Office came down and he was talking to my office and Linda Mayro's office with the county. And he had recently at that point been to a meeting with the National Park Service. And at that meeting, somebody had raised the question of joint commissions. Um, so we are a CLG, a certified local government, and Pima County is also a certified local government. So at that meeting, somebody had said, um, can two CLGs operate together? And the National Park Service at that time said, no, you should not be operating together. So we, with that direction, kind of started looking at separating from Pima County. Um, we have been a CLG, City of Tucson has been a CLG since 1990, and Pima County has been one since 2011. Um, but we had been operating together as a joint commission since like the 70s or so, um, for quite some time. So we started working on separating, and then the pandemic hit. Um, we lost all kinds of staff. We got sent home to work. It was just like <coughs> pandemonium. Um, so it kind of put it by this by the by the wayside. Um, more recently, like last fall, late summer, or fall, the mayor and council invited Chris Cody, who at the time was the deputy shippo, um, down to talk to them. And Chris Cody, they asked him about the separation. Chris Cody said yes. Um, we did tell them to do that. They have um, not been working on that um, or following through, and they should. So we received direction from mayor and council to proceed with the separation. We hired Michael Baker International to work on it because there's two staff members, and it's with our workload, we can't work on that too. Um, so we hired Michael Baker to Jr. to work on the separation process. As part of the separation process, we also asked them to look at some other code updates um, that we wanted them to consider. Um, among those, we had them kind of do best practices and look at some other cities. They looked at um, <clears throat> Pasadena, they looked at Phoenix, and they looked at Salt Lake cities. Uh, we tried to keep them kind of on the West, in the Western United States. But we had them look at designation of interiors currently we do not designate interiors so we wanted them to look at that we wanted them to look at um per fees for unpermitted work so when people do work to houses where they're taking down an addition or seriously we're modeling a designated addition and they don't have permits for it you know do these other cities have fees associated with them we wanted them to look at deconstruction um, it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. So when a property is torn down or an addition is torn down, rather than sending all of those materials to the landfill, you know, what are these other cities doing? Are they like parsing them out so they're going to architectural salvage? Are they being made readily available to other neighbors who may want a window that is being used in that demo demolished um, addition or something along those lines? 
had them look at that. We had them look at how other cities handle minor reviews. Um, is it something that's done by staff? Is it something that's done by the review commission? Um, we had them look at um, the big one is um, how they have their reviews. Is it a two tier review um, where we have like we have an advisory board and then we have the plans review subcommittee? Or is it a one tier review? Is it a staff review? How, how is that operated? And then really we look at, you know, who, who is um, signing the letters? Is it the historic preservation officer who's designing decision letters? Is it the director? Like we have signing decision letters and all of that. So they started to do their research and we held four stakeholder meetings. Our initial meeting was um, really limited to like around 15 people. We had the chairs of each advisory board we had the chair and the co-chair of the historic commission. We had um, some, we had some uh, architects and developers like Bob Lanning, Corky Poster, people who work a fair amount in the historic district. And we had property owners um, that had been through the process who lived in the historic districts. They did one-on-one -on -one interviews and kind of got a feel for people. And then we had three more stakeholder meetings. And in the three other stakeholder meetings, we enlarged our stakeholder group. That included more residents, uh, more developers and ar architects. Um, we had representatives from the tribe, um, from the Tootootum and from the Paskiyaki tribes. Um, we had um, the county was present because they're going through the process just like we are. And so we had a number of people. We worked through and took comments from a number of the applicants. And we were originally proposing to eliminate the plans review subcommittee and have the full commission do the product reviews. We were also talking about um, incorporating the advisory board membership into the plans, into the commission somehow so that the so that there would be representatives from the advisory board neighborhoods and districts into the commission. So rather than a two tier review process, it would be a one tier review process where comments would be made at the commission. As we moved along, the, the, there was quite a bit of pushback on um, eliminating the plans review subcommittee. So we brought back the plans review subcommittee and then had it, had it suggested or recommended that the advisory boards are then incorporated into the plans review subcommittee. So the advisory boards as they stand today would not function. They would be part of the plans review subcommittee. So at our last stakeholder meeting, which we had in June, that is the proposal that we had put forward to the stakeholders. Um, there was a fair amount of pushback and a, a number of letters that went to mayor and council about that. Um, the El Presidio sent one, Fort Lowell El, and Armory Park, all the advisory boards sent one. While literally, while we were in our fourth stakeholder meeting, we received an email from SHPO that said, oh, NPS is now looking and taking a second look at the joint commission thing. You should stop what you're doing. So NPS can put their decision or letter together. Um, we, NPS could do that in six months. They could do that in 10 years. Um, there's really no timeline for when NPS would actually finish their study of joint commissions. So with that information, we are currently on a pause. Um, we expect to go back to mayor and council for direction probably in September, October. We were thinking August originally, but August apparently filled up really fast for mayor and council. So now we're looking at September, October. Um, well, we will go back to a study session um, with mayor and council and say, this is what we found out. You know, can you give us direction? Um, once we get direction from them, we could stop what we're doing 
we could move forward in a slightly different direction with maybe another stakeholder meeting um, or something along those lines. Ultimately, if we move forward, um, we still have to, so bear in mind when we go September, October to mayor and council, it's just direction. They're not voting on anything. So if we continue to move forward, we still have to go to the historic commission, the planning commission, and then back to mayor and council. When we go to the historic commission and the planning commission and mayor and council, those will be open meetings to anybody and their mother who can come and show up, hey, I support this or hey, I don't support this. Um, and go forward with that. And we will, staff will notify everybody once everything is set, we have dates and stuff like that. We will notify you. So you're welcome to come to those meetings and um, get an understanding or overview or you know listen in and understand what's going on. We um, don't have any dates yet though. So, cause we're currently on a pause um, with everything. And pretty much that's the update that I have. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Or if you think of questions later, because this was a ton of information that I gave to you, you're welcome to email me. And I'm happy to respond that way too. But the bottom line is nothing is going to happen right now. No. And Today, may not happen at any time within the next several years um no something will probably happen this year um we get direction so i don't know how mayor and council wants to move forward i i i try the jedi mind trick on as many people as i can and it never ever works for me <laughs> um so i but i do expect that we will get some kind of direction so something something could happen well, there are two issues, and one of them is waiting for uh, judgment about separating the commission, the city and county commissions. That's one issue, and that could have been easily settled with uh, name changes and uh, easy, simple se separation. The larger issues of looking at the roles and input and value of the historic district advisory boards um, of the expertise of the commission um, is a whole separate uh, issue uh, with a lot of deep concerns from many people. So that that will be something that we'll look at closely and really uh, appreciate being kept apprised of um, when this goes into study session for mayor and council um, and the process from there. Chris, I have a quick question. We will definitely let you know um, any meeting dates that we have and what gets scheduled. The The separation of the commission is actually more than just a text amendment. Um, it is a, it, it is a bigger issue. There is an IGA involved. There is there is actually code language associated with that. So it is not contrary to the belief that it's just a quick little thing. It's actually not a quick thing, even with the commission separation. But they are two separate issues. They changing are. the role of the commission, uh, changing the uh, composition of the commission, changing the role uh, and composition uh, of the advisory boards. Um, so that's there. They are two two big, entirely separate issues. I, I will add to though that, however, right now you're just moving along as you're moving along, um, because we there is no decisions um, on anything being made. So you're operating as you have always operated um, and you should continue to do that. Um, ultimately, the one thing I forgot to add, the one thing that's kind of come out of it is we will be asking for more staff um, and hopefully in historic specifically. I have gotten the question a couple of times that um, people have read an article probably maybe three weeks ago now that mayor and council approved 14 new staff members for PDSD. That did not include any historic staff, nor should it, because there's like engineering that's totally flooded and there's like site review that's just beat down. And those are the guys that are actually getting, they're the ones who are getting the 14 new staff members. But as part of this, even if we keep the advisory boards or there's some other format or something like that, we will be asking for more staff um, to help us out. Sorry. Which we could easily support. Thank you. Christopher has been trying to ask a question. I, I've been following this issue, Jody. Thank you for that, that analysis. That was really very helpful. Um, 
because my head has been spinning around it recently. That, that was my question for you related to what your current comment. Maybe you have more comments. What is your position or what are your requests? Um, if mayor, mayor and council ask you, what would you ask back? Or what would you recommend? So um, that's a very good, um, tricky question. Um, I am, while I am the historic preservation <coughs> officer, I have managers just to direct to. And so you're still formulating, even if that there would be a recommendation or, you know, to move forward or whatever. Um, so we haven't, we are still talking with our management to figure out how we want to formulate that. So I have at this point in time, to be honest with you, no recommendation. Uh, I haven't even written a staff report yet. So, you know, that's when it's all coming down to you. You're writing your staff report and you're like, oh, what am I going to say? But yeah, sorry. Yeah, more staff is a good start though. Absolutely. Um, I will also, as another side note, just in case it blends with staff updates, I wanted to let you know that Scott um, Scott Clark has been reassigned to the city manager's office and he is no longer the director of planning and development services. Just so you guys are all aware of that. Who is the interim? Um, the interim is um, Tim Termer. To Muir, I, I yes, Tom, Tim Tamur. I can't, I can't wrap my mouth around his name. Um, and um, he's there. And then Lynn Birkenbein, she'll be the one who's signing decision letters, and she's there today. She's the deputy director. Thank Any you. other questions? Like I said, if you guys have comments or anything, you're welcome to email and um, I'm happy to answer those questions and take note of your comments. And, and we've gotten some comments previously, like I said, the Neighborhood Association for El Presidio um, submitted a layer, letter to mayor and council. Um, so we've, we've gotten that. Thank you very much, Jody. That's a helpful update. Are there other comments or questions before we conclude? Could I hear a motion to conclude? Motion to conclude. Second from Christopher. Thank you. Thanks all for coming out in this evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be well, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.